Hi there once again everyone. So we're about to break for half term and what I'd like to do today is to just have a final look over extract four. Say one or two things about extract four. Give you some predicted questions that you may wish to look at for extract four. And then have a little bit of a look at extract five uh, in anticipation of looking at it in more detail after the Easter break. So you can see in front of you, in front of me, I have the specification and I have the specification for the F585 section and I've opened it at page 22 and extract 4 really focuses on these first four bullet points. Distinguishing between absolute and comparative advantage, analysing the effects of international trade, outlining the pattern of global trade, and then evaluating comparative advantage as an explanation of global trade patterns. Now we've said before in these videos that extract 5 is always the basis of the essay question. So if we take a step backwards, that means that in extract 4 we're looking for a 2C question and the C parts of questions 1 and 2 are always comment questions. So that's really what we're looking for in this particular extract 4. These four particular bullet points, those of you who are using the A2 OCR textbook written by Colin Bamford, Susan Grant and Stephen Walton, you can find the relevant section in that book beginning on page 239. And on page 239 it lists those bullet points from the specification and you ought to be able to see from that which pages of that specification, which page of that textbook you will need to know well for the exam. So let's flick into the pre-release material once again. Okay, here we go. So here's, oh, there we are. There's extract four. I hope you've all downloaded the updated version with the amended figure 4.2 details on it. And so we'll take a quick run through this, not spending too long on it this time because we have looked at this before, but let's just have a brief look at it. First of all, we're presented with the data on real GDP growth for 2012. Key things to note are obviously the European Union uh, negative growth, the developed economies of the world such as the United Kingdom not growing particularly quickly and the real booming growth coming from the developing nations of China and Africa. It's important to note that in the introduction we're told that the growth of world trade fell from 5.2% to 2%. So it didn't actually fall, it's just growing at a slower rate. And if you search for this report online, you will see that in the foreword to the report it says that one of the amazing things that's happened in recent years is that the developing nations of the world have pulled themselves up and managed to successfully grow, not by trading necessarily more with the developed world, but by trading more with one another, which is a very interesting facet of this particular extract. So let's move to figure two, figure 4.2. You'll see in the specification, one of the things that you're asked to be aware of is what is the pattern of global trade? Well, you've given a perfect example of that pattern of global trade in this particular figure 4.2. The APT uh, organization, which some of you may be familiar with, have produced a revision resource for this, and in that they have identified all of the different percentage changes. 
So, in 1990, trade between developed countries was 57%. In 2000, it falls to 50%. And in 2011, it falls to 36%. So over that time period, a continuous decline in the relative share of trade between developed economies. And we're told something of the reasons for that in the introduction with regard to the recession and so on, the problems in the Euroland, etc. Next particular trade flow is between developed and developing economies. Now the APT document tells us that that one has gone from, let me just see, I think it's gone from 33% to 36% to 38%. So this process of globalization, breaking down trade barriers, encouraging specialization according to comparative advantage, and encouraging trade and so on and so forth, it has enabled the developing economies to gain a slightly, a marginally bigger foothold in trade with developed economies. And then finally, the third, uh, certainly uh, biggest one, is of course trade between developing economies. I referenced that WTO quote for you earlier. But it's gone from about 8% in 1990 to 12% in 2000 to 24% in 2011. So they really are, the developing nations, pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. And how are they doing that? They are doing it by trading, not necessarily with the developed world, but trading with one another. Now, of course, you may say to yourselves, well, how is it they are doing that? Surely the developing nations of the world will all be producing goods, for example, all in the primary sector. So why would they want to trade with one another? Surely they want to trade with the developed world, export their primary goods and import secondary goods, export their agricultural products and import capital equipment to enable them to grow and develop. A very interesting uh, point about that and made in the APT revision booklet is as follows. that the, the BRIC nations, if we consider China, for example, the developing economy, it is growing, as you well know, by increasing its manufacturing base. So they're producing a large number of goods and services, manufactured goods in the secondary sector. And in order to do that, they are hoovering up at a vast rate a lot of the world's resources. Now, a lot of those resources come from other developing nations. And so as one developing nation exports primary goods, the other, that same nation is then importing secondary manufactured goods from the developed, the developing economy rather, which is China. So we have two developing economies, one exporting a primary good and the other exporting a manufactured good. Now, that goes some way, I feel, to explaining the data in this particular figure 4.4. We know, and I guess you're looking at this at first glance, it's slightly odd that Zambia and the Central African Republic should have intra-industry numbers which are close, so close to zero because this suggests that they are exporting, for example, primary sector goods and importing, for example, secondary sector goods. Now, one would think that is odd at first, but if we consider, as APT put it to us, that they are exporting primary goods, for example, natural resources to China, and then the Chinese economy are sending them in return cheap manufactured goods, which are of course produced in the secondary sector, that would then help to explain why those numbers for Zambia and the Central African Republic are so low. And rather than them being dependent on intra-industry trade, they are more dependent on inter-industry trade, which is obviously producing a good in one sector, primary sector or tertiary, and then importing a good in a different sector 
primary, secondary, and tertiary. That is not the case, as we can see, for the more developed economies of the world, where the numbers here, 70, 66, 65, 65, so these countries are predominantly exporting in one sector and importing goods from the same sector. Let's move back to figure 4.2. Now we've been through this, I've been through this a couple of times now, and there are all sorts of different things and all sorts of different percentages and so on that you can work out here and calculate and so on and so forth. But I think obviously one of the key things is that the proportion of intra-industry trade gets more and more important as the years go by. It doesn't really matter which of the six uh, sectors, which of the six uh, global areas you're looking at. Intra-industry trade is becoming more and more important, not only in relative terms, but in absolute terms as well. The only exception to that being Europe. Now, that suggests, obviously, that countries may not necessarily be trading with other countries who have a comparative advantage in the production of a certain good because once you start trading in terms of intra, i.e. within a block, of course the trade barriers disappear. And so even though the country within the block may be less efficient, it is often cheaper to trade with said country because if you were to bring the good in from a comparatively more efficient country outside of the block, that may be subject to a tariff and so it would ultimately be more expensive. And of course that then tends to skew the comparative advantage. If we look at figure 4.5, we can see that, generally speaking, the developing economies of the world are gaining comparative advantage in manufacturing and the developed economies are gaining comparative advantage in advanced services. 